uh, Dr. Robert Wright. Uh, I, now, I don't know, Lawrence just said whether or not Robert should go second, and I said, well, I actually have him in my notes that he's second, and then when I said Robert's up next, he gave me the shock glance. So <laughs> you're up next, you're third, off we go. Uh, Robert holds um, uh, the Neff uh, Family Chair of Political Economy at Augustana University in South Dakota. Before uh, that, uh, Dr. Wright served as the Clinical Associate Professor of Economics at the Stern School of Business in New York, at New York University. He was also guest curator for the Museum of American Finance. Dr. Wright has written for Barron's, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Forbes.com, and other prominent publications, and has also appeared on uh, NPR, C-SPAN, and the BBC. Dr. Wright established the Thomas Willing Institute for the Study of Financial Markets, Institutions, and Regulations at Augustana and to promote the public's understanding of the financial system. So with that, Dr. Wright. Thank you. I was also on the CBC once, there you about go. 10 years ago. <laughs> Everybody's playing the thing. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of uh, really like a uh, policy uh, historian. I'm, uh, the, <laughs> the blurb said that I've, I've written 19 books about uh, the topic I'm giving today, but that, that was an editing error. I've written 19 books about stuff, not all about, <laughs> about this topic, um, which is going to be uh, quite <laughs> – well, which would be crazy, right? It would just be insane. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, so uh, uh, I can dispense with the first couple of pages informally here, I think, because uh, you guys all know that uh, uh, Canada's banking system uh, is, has quite a reputation uh, globally for being the, the most stable, uh, you know, in the world of a major, uh, of a major uh, country. And so uh, it's um, not quite a natural experiment, you know, because we know that uh, Canada and the U.S. are, are, are different in, in many ways. Um, and we also know that people who are born in northern latitudes and live in northern latitudes are just naturally superior to people from... Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm from Rochester, New York, by the way. I'm born within sight of the... Of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of, of Toronto. So... Um, it, it, but uh, it, it does give us, uh, you know, a, a nice, uh, a nice little quasi-natural experiment in political economy to see how policies, you know, can make things different, how cultures um, and and so forth can make things uh, make things different. Now, um, you know, the, there there was this little uh, this little issue with this. Um, Home Capital Group earlier in the year, and so the Wall Street Journal was saying, "Oh, maybe the Canadians, uh, you know, aren't flawless, and uh, and so on and so forth." So that's part of the motivation. Uh, Waleed gave a paper yesterday where he said uh, Canada should support inbound and outbound F, um, uh, uh, FDI, uh, except in banking. Except in banking, because and I I understand I I can see why you guys don't want Wells Fargo coming coming up here, right? That's like urinating in your own well, um, awful, evil, poorly run monstrosity, right? Why 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 have that uh, why why have that come up uh, uh, come up here? So there so the, there there is that uh, issue as well about you know whether. Um, uh, Canadian uh, uh, policy should 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 open up uh, the, the financial system to uh, to U.S. and other uh, other other banks. Um, we know that uh, the the uh, Canadian Canadian banks um, had no problem during the the Great Depression. Uh, we know they had no problem uh, um, in terms of larger. Uh, comparatively little problem uh, in the Great Depression and uh, no, no problems essentially in the Great Recession. Right? There were no big bailouts uh, in, in Canada, un, uh, unlike uh, south of the border. And we know that um, you know, basically they, they got by r right at the margin. Right? They, they didn't have huge, they weren't, some, some countries just had such uh, rep repressive um, regulations that they were just sitting on huge amounts of capital. And of course, they were, they were fine, but not very profitable, right? The Canadian banks were right at, they had, they had it just, just, uh, uh, just right. 
Uh, so uh, we, we want to understand uh, how, how it is that uh, you know Canada does so. so other countries can can learn uh, uh, from uh, uh, from its uh, from its successes. So uh, there's this big book, um, Charlie uh, Kilmaris and, and and Steve Haber, um, 2014, fragile fragile by design, and uh, they attribute the stability of Canada's uh, financial system uh, to uh, to a dearth of populism. Uh, in the Great White North, uh, their, uh, their rich country model posits that unchecked pop populism will lead to lax lending regulations and in inadequate capital ratios, which lead pretty inexorably to banking system uh, fragility. The model, the model works extremely well in the lands of one, one and zeros, uh, and zeros and ones, by which I mean you know dummy, dummy variables and regression equations. Um, but uh, uh, you know, in, so so in this in this world, U.S. populism gets a one, and Canadian populism gets a zero, right? Um, uh, and uh, the United States financial system gets a one for for fragility, and Canada gets a, a zero for fragility. But of course, the real world uh, is more complex than than ones and zeros. Uh, most importantly. Um, you know these less objective, less measurable uh, variables like populism uh, must be considered with extreme care because perceptions of them are, are often colored by salient events. Right. So you go 100 years in the future, a historian looking back at the United States in 2017 is going to say we're very, very, very populist uh, because of um, uh, Trump having to win uh, an election. Right. Um, in fact, the U.S. is less populous today than it was in 2015 uh, because of the reaction against Trump. Um, but you know, try to try to convince a historian of that uh, in, in 100 years, right? Good, uh, good luck. So uh, I, I don't like that populism variable because uh, it's just it's just so difficult to measure. And as pointed out, there have been populist strains uh, in Canada. In fact, you could argue that Canada is much more populous than uh, the United States. So populist, in fact, that um, uh, most of their policies pass more quickly. So uh, they left much less of a, uh, of a, of a, uh, a, a mark in the historical uh, record, right? Um, and this is why you know, many, many people in the United States consider uh, Canada socialist. Right, because of, uh, of many of your policies that were passed because of these populist uh, 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 these populist uh, impulses, um, so uh, I, I don't uh, I, I don't buy this uh, this populist. So I mean it may be true, but uh, these measurement uh, issues are are so. Are are so uh, are so difficult. The the stability, uh, you know, you have to grant overall. But again, it's 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 difficult to measure uh, in very precise uh, uh, terms. Um, so Canada's uh, banking system is certainly more stable than that of the U.S., but its record is far from uh, perfect. Uh, Canadian banks suspended specie payments during the financial crises and political uprisings of 1837 through 39. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was this infamous flood of uh, American shin plasters across the uh, across the border, um, and uh, starting with the Panic of 1857, another uh, a number of Canadian banks outright failed uh, after investing too heavily in, in railroad stocks in Western lands. 1866, the Bank of Upper Canada, the sole fiscal agent of the government, failed after a. a um, a decade of difficulties that were rooted back in the 1850s boom. The commercial bank uh, failed uh, as well. Um, and uh, from uh, 1868 until the Great Depression, another uh, nine Canadian banks failed. Uh, two more were voluntarily uh, liquidated, uh, which just meant that they had the sense to wind up affairs before, <laughs> you know, before the inevitable uh, end. Uh, 22 Canadian banks and trusts failed between uh, 1968 and 1985, um, and uh, you know some some folks uh, will tell you that Canada uh, almost had a savings and loan like uh, crisis in the uh, in the 19 uh, the 1980s that hasn't gotten a lot of uh, a lot of press or a lot of uh, a lot of consideration. Uh, there were all sorts of close calls. Uh, there's a story uh, about the Dominion Bank um, where. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, a teller told a foreign uh, a foreign customer he was trying to explain why he couldn't why he couldn't cash the check, and he very loudly said, "No money in the bank." <laughs> Instead of you know insufficient funds, right? Because the guy just wasn't getting it. Well, so some other folks with limited English skill hear no money in the bank, and they go and they tell uh, uh, other. And pretty soon there's a run uh, on 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 the Dominion Bank. Um, there's probably something about this in your in your archives, and. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the other banks, for reasons I'll talk about in a little bit, understood that Dominion Bank was perfectly fine and, and gave it the liquidity it needed to, uh, to, out, uh, to outlast the, uh, uh, the run. But um, so uh, the, the depositor and, and note holder losses, uh, when there were Canadian banking failures, generally ran nil to negligible. Uh, but uh, clearly the system faced the costs uh, associated with lack of access. And we heard a little bit about this um, from, from the earlier uh, presentation. Uh, until the big banks were uh, fully allowed into the mortgage market in 1967, the Canadian mortgage market was smaller than that in the U.S. on a per capita basis. Most lending was done by individuals or subsidized by your, your so-called uh, near banks, which included uh, insurance and trust companies uh, and building societies uh, and a government agency. Uh, particularly in the 1950s, uh, Canada suffered from from sort of a, a mortgage uh, a mortgage crunch where there um, wasn't uh, there wasn't enough uh, uh, funds being uh, supplied. Uh, Can uh, Canadians had more bank offices per capita than the Americans uh, uh, did, um, but finer estimates of the geographical distribution of the offices say the number of uh, banking offices within a 50 kilometer radius or the percentage of the population with at least one banking office within a 20 kilometer radius uh, or the percentage of towns with at least X number of inhabitants that had at least one banking office, uh, you know, uh, remain, uh, remain unclear. Moreover, it wasn't until 1936 that uh, a Canadian bank, the CBIC, uh, started to make consumer loans, and not until well after World War II uh, did some banks, like Scotia Bank and uh, Royal, enter a field that by then was well well plowed uh, in in America. Before Canadian banks entered the consumer banking business in a serious way, uh, loan sharks—I uh, don't know unless there was a different name up, uh, for them up here, loan mooses or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, high-priced high uh, finance uh, beavers, I guess, with the teeth. Um, high-priced finance companies uh, and other near banks, uh, not subject uh, to usury caps, were uh, were rampant. So, in short, I don't see much value in attributing Canada's relative banking stability to high falutin causes like checks against populism. Kel, uh, Kel and Marison here were on much firmer ground when they examined the uh, economic causes of stability. Uh, which I summarize uh, as uh, uh, minimal moral hazard. So the Canadian government long resisted uh, deposit insurance, uh, which essentially forced larger banks to monitor smaller ones and to share any losses that failed institutions imposed on directors. That induced Canada's biggest banks to seek out and acquire failing institutions like these unit, uh, these unit banks uh, before they expired. Monitoring costs were relatively low because most banks established branches, if not headquarters, along St. James Street in Montreal and or near Bay Street in Toronto. Uh, moreover, bankers regularly mingled in social activities, including uh, what by all accounts was a wicked bank hockey league. Uh, does anyone know about the Bank Hockey League? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Canadian government also refused to use public money to pay off bank creditors or stockholders. Uh, in short, uh, Canadian bankers uh, have very little expect expectation of being bailed out by the government and reduce their risk taking accordingly. Uh, second is this constant legislative monitoring, which we heard about uh, a bit uh, yesterday. Unlike in the U.S. in the 20th century, the charters of Canadian banks have to be re renewed periodically and the government reviewed banking legislation every decade and now every five years. This is, this is unprecedented, right? Uh, what we do in the United States, as Joe Martin pointed out yesterday, is wait until there's a big problem and then c come in with Band-Aids uh, and, 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 and slap on it. Sometimes really big, awkward, costly um, Band-Aids, like, like Dodd-Frank, right? Um, so uh, it, it's, Congress is much more reactive rather than, uh, than, than, than proactive. 
And this goes way back. You can go to the, the SNL crisis with Fireia. You can go to the Great Depression with the FDIC and all that, and even further back in, uh, in U.S. Uh, history. What I think uh, Calamaris and Haber uh, missed is the superior governance of Canadian banks. They take governance for granted, assuming that the incentives of stockholders and managers are always consistently aligned. That was not the case in the United States in the years leading up to the panic of uh, 2008 when bank executives regularly received heads I win, tails I win uh, contracts. To understand the governance of Canadian banks, we need to go back to the beginning when Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and other U.S. founding fathers said, let there be corporations, and there were. And lo, they were good because they were well-governed. So well-governed that over 20,000 times before 1861, Americans invested in the, in the shares, well, technically options on uh, shares, of startup businesses most of which had no operating history whatsoever. All right, this goes against like finance uh, 101 and the pecking order hypothesis and, and, and all that. And, and the reason they were willing to do so is because these uh, early corporations were so well governed because uh, they did not have to fear uh, any uh, expropriation of their resources uh, because as stockholders, they had it in their power in the form of sundry checks and balances uh, which is too numerous and, uh, and mundane to compre comprehensively discuss here, but look at one of those 19 books, uh, Corporation Nation, um, <clears throat> to, to stop managerial self-dealing, whether the company was a turnpike or a manufacturer uh, or a bank. Provisions in many early bank charters and bylaws mandated that directors not be bankrupt and that much of their wealth be invested in their respective bank stock which, of course, align the incentives closely uh, with those of the bank. According to bank, uh, banking historians uh, Adam Short and Bray Hammond, Canada essentially imported its bank governance from the United States, specifically from Alexander Hamilton, who was a great stickler for governance checks and balances and the primary author of at least four early seminal corporate charters, those of the Bank of New York, the Bank of the United States, the Society for the Establishment of Useful Manufacturers, and the Merchants Bank of New York. From Hamilton, for example, came the notion of prudent mean voting rules that restricted the power of the largest shareholders so that minority holders would have some board representation, which tended uh, to keep managerial uh, self-dealing and large stockholder self-dealing uh, self in check. As with many converts, Canadians were more stalwart in their convictions than the original acolytes themselves, as the Canadians witnessed and learned from the banking excesses that infected early America. Their first banking charters copied that of the Bank of the United States, which, of course, Hamilton designed to function as a large bank with multiple branches spread across the nation, uh, almost verbatim. The first permanent commercial bank in, in Canada, the Bank of Montreal, uh, which was established in 1817, sent key men to study the operations of the second bank of the United States, which was a huge nationwide bank with branches that was modeled after uh, Hamilton's uh, uh, first bank of the United States. The Bank of Canada, established in Montreal the following year, utilized the same BUS charter and was formed with American capital. It soon failed, however, and was absorbed by the more conservatively, re conservatively run Bank of Montreal, a pattern that repeated itself throughout Canadian history. Other competitors like the Royal Bank thrived in part by emulating and snatching executives and other talent away from uh, the BMO, uh, Commerce, and other leading Canadian banks. Two other circumstances helped to get early Canadian banks on the straight and narrow. First, the agricultural Quebecois or Habitants disrupted, uh, distrust, distrusted non-specie forms of money so intensely that they quickly redeemed any banknotes that fell to them in the course of business. That, in turn, taught bankers to maintain conservative uh, reserve levels. Second, the imperial overlords in London had something to say about colonial banking regulation, and uh, as a matter of course, they stressed conservative banking practices. Their goal, after all, was to extract rents from their colonies, not to speed their economic independence. They explicitly looked at the U.S. experience to learn what could go wrong. Uh, it sounds like my parenting uh, style. Uh, and built safeguards into the Privy Council for Trade uh, uh, Privy Council for Trade's 1830 Colonial Banking Guidelines. 
capital was to be at least half paid in before operations could begin. Insider lending was limited to one-third of each bank's resources. Weekly balance sheets were to be published and verified under oath. Stockholders were under double liability. Uh, lending on the collateral of real estate or their bank's own stock was strictly prohibited. Directors had to have substantial investments in their banks and so forth. From both Hamilton and, and the Scots came the, the notion that fewer larger banks were preferable to smaller, more numerous banks. Bigger banks would attract better qualified employees at the higher echelons of the bank, along for more professional management. The assets of bigger banks also tended to be more diversified geographically and by economic sector, and hence naturally more stable. Because of its uh, belief in Hamiltonian big banks, uh, Canada made uh, banking a national prerogative rather than a provincial one. Uh, or both national and provincial as the United States did. Fewer banks chartered by fewer jurisdictions meant less experimentation, less opportunity for regulatory arbitrage, and more uniformity around best practices. So unlike in some US, uh, US jurisdictions, such as Massachusetts, where banks were encouraged to proliferate in order to swell state tax revenues, but unlike uh, other US jurisdictions, such as New York, where new banks were not encouraged until the late uh, 1830s, Canadian lawmakers had relatively little reason to pass new banking charters and relatively more reason to encourage existing banks to establish agencies or full-blown branches in growth areas. In short, path dependence and uh, what I call original obedience, uh, the opposite of original sin, uh, are more important than populist influences as an explanation of Canadian banking system stability. Basically, Canada took a free ride on U.S. banking experimentation, adopting the Hamiltonian best and rejecting the populist rest. And the Hamiltonian best stuck. The Canadian Bank of Commerce, for example, mandated it in its new 1909 bylaws that directors had to remain solvent and own at least 100 shares of stock in order to keep their positions. This is at a time when U.S. unit banks are being run by, uh, you know, known bankrupts <laughs> um, who own no stock in their own bank, right? Um, the bylaws also maintain the old bonding rules, restrictions on outside employment business, and 360-degree uh, uh, employee monitoring uh, mechanisms that were common uh, in uh, early 19th century U.S. bank charters and uh, bylaws. Re read Howard, Howard Bodenhorn's uh, books for uh, details on that. Bank historians have often attributed Canada's relatively good economic showing during the Great Depression to its branch banking system. Unlike in the United States, the right to establish uh, branches was explicit, and many early provincial bank charters and sometimes informally considered acceptable, even if not explicitly authorized, until 1841 when the right to branch was formally recognized. By 1929, Canada had only 11 banks, down from its apex of 41 in 1885-86, uh, uh, and the top four controlled 77% of the country's banking assets. As noted previously, a, a few banks failed, but most exited by selling themselves to larger banks when they realized that they could not earn competitive profits. California, the only large state that allowed intrastate branching before the Depression, uh, also did relatively well during the downturn, leading many to conclude uh, that bigger banks are more stable banks. What is often overlooked, however, is that Canada went off from gold de facto before the Great Depression began, uh, as proven by the U.S. Canadian dollar exchange rate, which follow, uh, violated uh, Canada's specie export uh, points starting in 1929. That was possible because Canada's Department of Finance stopped redeeming Dominion notes in gold because it was running out of the precious yellow stuff quite apart from the Depression. Uh, and as Ben Bernanke uh, and other researchers have shown, devaluation or abandonment of the gold standard was the key to recovery during the Great Depression. So Canada's relative economic success in the 1930s is unsurprising and, again, uh, quite unrelated to populism. Another fact that is uh, often overlooked is that Canada lost many of its uh, bank branches during the Depression as the big banks colluded to uh, decrease uh, competition. Uh, the C CIBC alone shuttered over 130 branches and ceased lending on the prairies in the Newfoundland. Royal Bank and all the other biggies shuttered about 10% of their domestic branches on average, and even the, the Hoary Bank of Montreal eased off many of its foreign commitments. Canada's big banks wobbled, as one bank historian put it, but they did not topple. That same historian admitted, however, that it was a close thing. Bank dividends shrank throughout the Depression and were not as large as they seemed 
uh, as they were based on the par value of stock, usually $100, when market prices for most big banks were in the $300 range. In addition, the number of employees shrank, as did average earnings per employee. Moreover, two of the three, uh, the country's three regional clearinghouses closed, leaving all clearing to be done in Toronto. The bank's experience runs in Alberta, though uh, mostly due to some kooky provincial credit experiments um, there, <laughs> rather than um, rather than uh, uh, you know fear of uh, the uh, bank uh, bank insolvency. Um, <clears throat> All, all of the, uh, the Canadian banks help, were, were helped by uh, a form of um, regulatory uh, forbearance. Uh, the bank histories, if, if you read them, the old ones, I haven't read yours yet, but the old ones all tell similar stories about uh, being unable to collect old debts, especially from farmers. Um, and uh, they, they didn't have to write these off or even mark them to, to market. Uh, they were allowed to, to stay on the on the books, partly because of you know the crazy accounting assumptions that would have to be made. Um, one of the one of the books the, talks about a C, CIBC branch manager and an employer who uh, uh, took twelve live turkeys uh, in payment of a farmer's twenty five dollar note. Um, after ruining their clothes in three hours, they uh, realized only $12 for the plucked uh, birds, most of which they sold to the bank's uh, own employees. One minute? Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So uh, along with, not the populism story, but the economic story that I told earlier by, by um, Keller Maris and, and, and Haber, they miss the, uh, the governance uh, component. Um, and it, so uh, U.S. bank governance deteriorated very badly, uh, a point that uh, folks like Wilma Sauce uh, point, pointed out, in, uh, a shareholder uh, advocate pointed out in the 1950s and, and 1960s. Bank governance in the U.S. was, was horrible. Canadian banks didn't suffer that same degree of uh, degradation, uh, partly because they were subject to double liability uh, back when they could uh, issue notes before uh, 1944, uh, the no bailout uh, policy um, uh, that I mentioned, um, Canada's big nationwide branch, uh, or banks are very valuable uh, franchises. Um, for both managers and stockholders, so they want to uh, uh, protect uh, protect that uh, uh, franchise. Um, so, due to relatively strong stockholder monitoring, Canadian bankers have not uh, had the incentive or ability to write themselves ridiculous sort of heads I win, tails I win instead of contracts that became all current south of the border around the turn of the last uh, century. Uh, most directors were outside directors. Um, and uh, they uh, had uh, incentives to uh, keep uh, Canadian banks profitable, uh, but not crazy cuckoo profitable uh, by taking on excessive risk. Thank you. Thank you.